So, have you ever wondered how you can make your game characters move around your levels in a clever way? Avoid obstacles and plan courses with neat shortcuts? You know, the kind of intelligent autopathing that happens in Blizzard Diablo games, for example. Well, today we're going to see that, in our modern game engines, that's actually not that hard to do. Hello everyone, I'm Mina, and in this new God of War C-Sharp tutorial, we're going to see how to implement a simple 3D point-and-click navigation system. Now, a few weeks ago, I published a tutorial on 2D point-and-click navigation, and in that video, I explained how in 2D, in Godot, it's really quite simple to get a target point from a mouse click. Then, using Godot's built-in navigation nodes, we defined walkable areas, added obstacles, and finally we got a navigation agent that could auto-compute the best path to a target point thanks to the famous A-star algorithm. So in this video, I want to continue on that topic and talk about how to do the same thing, but in 3D. Alright, first of all, we need to see how we can transform a 2D mouse position on our screen into a matching 3D position. More specifically, here we want to find a way of clicking on the ground, so we need to use our mouse click and our camera settings to project this 2D screen position in the 3D world. To do this, the trick is to use what we call a raycast. In a nutshell, a raycast is like an imaginary beam that we can use to check if an object is facing a certain direction, or if our cursor is hovering something, or where a projection of a point should end up. So it's a long oriented line that starts from a specific point and is cast in a specific direction, usually at a finite distance. It's also important to note that raycasts are physical objects, meaning that they're going to perform all those checks by looking at the physical colliders in your scene, and not at meshes or other visual elements. As is explained in the Godot docs, the engine provides us with some nice utilities to create raycasts from our camera plane, and so to project a 2D point into the 3D world. In particular, Godot can abstract away the differences between perspective and orthographic projections, which is really cool, because this can complicate things quite a lot. So in fact, as Godot devs, all we have to do is to use the project ray origin and project ray normal methods of our camera node to compute our ray. The snippet in the doc is a nice point to start, so let's create a new c -sharp script in our demo scene, on the root node for example, and in the input function, we'll re-implement the logic from the docs. We'll simply wrap it in an event check that executes this logic when we right-click instead of left-clicking. Also note that to clean up this code a little, we should actually separate the click check from the raycast check, because as noted in the Godot docs, it's better to run your physics queries in the physics process function. So let's keep track of our interactions in some class variables, and then run our raycast logic in the physics process method. Okay, now, suppose that we want to instantiate some object at our projected mouse position whenever we right-click. So basically, we want to show some little target point marker. Here, I'm going to use this target point prefab that I prepared beforehand. And it's simply a quad mesh with a little shader and an animation player that has this circle grow and fade out, and then auto-freeze the object at the end. So I'll export a reference to this packed scene in my game manager script, then rebuild my project, and pick the scene in the inspector. And then, in the code, I'll instantiate this object when I right-click and I actually get a hit with my raycast. I'm going to use the position data inside my raycast result to get the 3D equivalent of the current 2D cursor location. So that's the 3D point where my ray hits the ground. At this point, if we run the game, you see that we indeed get raycast hits and our little target marker whenever we right-click, and it's properly placed at our mouse cursor position, but projected in the 3D world. However, you also notice that this happens with every object in our scene, even the ones that clearly can't serve as workable areas, like the walls, the columns, or the trees. 
to restrict the Rekas checks to just the ground, and let's get a simple point-and-click logic for our 3D navigation, we need to use Godot's physics layers. Indeed, because raycasts are physical objects that interact with the physical colliders in the scene, we can customize their search filter quite easily by excluding some specific physical objects or allowing only for colliders on a specific physics layer. Typically, let's say that we open up our various ground object prefabs and in their inspectors, we add the physics layer number 2 to their collision layer property. Note that here I've got several object types for the ground, because Kenny's pack contains a variety of workable models such as floors and stairs. But okay, so now our objects are on both the layer number 1 and the layer number 2, which means that they will still collide with all the other objects on layer number 1, but we can also find them with a raycast that looks only at the layer number 2. And to actually add this filtering, we just need to go back to our code, and where we create our mouse-based recast, update the query parameters that for now only contain the start and end point, and add an extra option to limit our search to only the layer number 2. Now, be careful, cause in scripts, layer masks are written as bit masks. So here, this 2 doesn't directly refer to the index of the layer, but rather its bit mask value. So here they're the same, but typically for the layer number 3, the value would be 4. And if you're not sure what the bitmask is for your layer, you can always go back to the editor and hover the layer cell in the inspector to check it out here. But alright, so now if we run our game again, we see that we only get hit when we right-click on the ground, so the floor and the stairs, and the clicked position is properly converted to a 3D target spot in the world, for a soon-to-be navigation agent. So that's pretty neat, and now it's time to work on our navigation logic. Now, truth be told, the Godo team did a pretty great job at making 2D and 3D navigation implementation virtually the same. So here, just like in our previous tutorial on 2D point-and-click navigation, we need to do the following. First, we'll define a 3D navigation region for agents to walk in. So we'll create a new nav region 3D node and put our entire scene inside it, and then we'll create a new navigation mesh resource inside the inspector of this new navigation region 3D node. Don't forget that this region can pass your child elements either according to the meshes, the colliders or both, depending on how you organize your workable areas and your obstacles. Here I'm going to stick with the mesh instances default option. Ok, now if we click the Bake Navigation Mesh button at the top, which is available whenever we have this Navigation Region node selected, we get a first version of our nav mesh displayed as a big blue overlay on the whole 3D scene. That's cool, but you also see that, for now, this mesh is far from perfect. In particular, at the moment, the mesh is too high compared to our actual ground, so it's going to look really weird if we try to use it as is. To fix this, let's go to our node's cells section and reduce the height value to something like 0.05. After rebaking, we get a way better mesh for our navigation. Similarly, it would be nice to have a more accurate parsing of our scene, and most notably, less space around our obstacles. Now, this is mostly computed based on the agent's radius, which we can change over here. But you see that this radius also depends on the mesh's cell size property, so let's reduce both those values a bit. And now if we rebake again, we get something that is more accurate and better describes our workable areas with all the flat surfaces and the stairs in the scene. By the way, I won't go into too much details, but typically for your stairs, you need to prepare colliders that are angled diagonally like this so that the nav mesh can actually compute the fact that there is a path along this diagonal. Ok, now the last step is to instantiate our 3D agent, which I've already started to work on, so it's a simple character body 3D, with a state machine based animator like the one that we created in this previous tutorial of the series. And this character hierarchy also contains a navigation agent 3D child node. 
Now, of course, uh, we should start by getting a reference to this agent node in our Sodius script, for example, in the ready function. Then, to have this nav agent actually move our character on the nav mesh when we click on the ground, we're going to give our agent script a new public function called setTargetPosition. Like last time when we worked on 2D navigation, we're going to take our desired target position and, if need be, stick it back on our navigation map using the mapGetClosestPoint method. Okay, now in the physics process function of our character, for now we're not doing a lot, we're basically just applying gravity. What we want to do is something similar to our previous episode, and use our agent's next position in its computed path to have it look in the right direction and to have it compute its velocity. All in all, you'll see that this is pretty much identical to what we did in the 2D tutorial, except that we need to ignore the y-axis because this is handled by our gravity logic. And also, we need to actually reset our horizontal velocity if our agent reaches its destination, because we can't just escape the function early anymore. Now, all that's left to do in our main demo manager is to get a reference to our character node and call its setTargetPosition function when we get a raycast hit, in addition to showing our little circle marker. And that's it! If we retry our game, you see that as soon as we click on the ground, our character now moves in our 3D scene towards this point while avoiding all the obstacles on the way. Of course, if your agent stops too soon, don't hesitate to tweak the navigation agent 3D node pathfinding parameters in the inspector, typically by setting some smaller distance values like this. And also, just as a quick improvement, you probably don't want the character to look up when it's climbing stairs, because that looks a bit weird so you might actually want to slightly modify the lookout logic. Basically, instead of using the next path position directly as the lookout target, we can extract it and then, in our lookout, compute a very similar vector but reprojected at our soldier's current height. And there we go, that's really cool. We've successfully implemented a 3D navigation system in Godot and C Sharp that is super easy to control with the mouse and that requires only two pretty small scripts and two nodes. Now, as a little bonus, let's wrap up this tutorial by exploring an advanced feature of Godot's navigation mechanic, the navigation links. Because for now, you'll notice that when our soldier gets to this ledge, for example, if we ask him to come back down, it has to do this big detour to take the stairs down to the ground level. But what if it could rather simply jump down? In short, navigation links are a way of creating a link between separate, non-contiguous navigation regions that are too far away to be automatically connected by Godot. Typically, this allows the agents to jump, climb a ladder, take a shortcut, or even teleport to another point instantly. In our case, it will allow us to create a specific jump path to let our character go from this upper level to the ground floor directly. To create a nav link, it's really straightforward. We simply have to create a new navigation link 3D node in our scene and play around with its start and end positions. For example, let's bring our nav link to this specific area of our level and then place its start and end positions on each side of this vertical drop. Note that you don't need two precise positions, but they both need to be on the accessible navigation mesh. Other than that, we're also going to toggle off the bidirectional option, because we want this link to only be traversable from start to end, meaning from top to bottom, and not the reverse. And that's it, basically. If we run the game again, we see that our character now still takes the stairs to get up, but then it can simply fall down to the ground in the other direction. So you see that, thanks to navigation links, we can really easily create shortcuts in our level and boost the overall flow. Though, just before we end this tutorial, I want to mention something really important, which is that those navigation links don't actually move the agent themselves. They just give it an alternative path when trying to reach a destination. So the only reason that our agent is going from this ledge to the ground floor 
is because we have all of our previous movement logic, with the gravity and the velocity. But typically, suppose that we have another bit of terrain over there with a gap in the middle, and a nav link that crosses this gap. You intuitively understand that I wanted to jump, but if I run my game and try to have my character cross this gap, you see that the soldier simply falls down, cause he's not actually jumping up. So there's just the gravity that drags him straight down. To solve this issue, we'd need to add our own logic, cause once again, Godot's navlings don't handle the movement automatically. Here, for example, we could add some 3D trigger areas with simple spherical shapes at both ends of our navlink, and then add a function in our character script to make him jump if it's the body that entered the area 3D. And then finally, we'd just recompile our project and assign this method as the callback for the body entered signal of our two area 3D nodes. This way, when we ask our agent to cross, it will go for this navlink and when it gets in the trigger areas on either side of the gap, it will get a little velocity boost and be able to actually cross the void, as expected. But in any case, there you go. You now know how to set up a basic 3D navigation system in Godot, with a little bit of raycasting, and we've even seen how to add some navigation links to easily add shortcuts or jump points and boost our level design. So I really hope you enjoyed this tutorial, if you did, feel free to like the video and subscribe to the channel to not miss the next ones. And of course, don't hesitate to check out my other good tutorials, my Blender series, and to drop a comment with your own ideas of good tricks or game dev tutorial ideas in general that you'd like me to do some videos on. As always, thanks a lot for watching, and take care.